So sometimes the place you're used to is not the place you belong. And this is a quote which has come to mean quite a lot to me over the last year or so. And that's for three very important reasons. And the first of these reasons is because it sparks a sense of adventure. The idea that there is a whole other world out there of places to go and things to explore. Secondly, it's because it makes me question myself. It makes me think, you know, what if this isn't it? What if I'm missing out? What if this world that I've created of, you know, my flat by the sea, the ability to change the heating from my phone, what if there are more important things out there? What if, what if I'm missing out on something? And the last of these reasons, these three reasons, is because it's from my favourite Disney film. Um, that's if you um, just go and basil the great mouse detective, which I also quite like. Um, but that film, um, my favourite Disney film, is a film called Queen of Katawi, about a young girl called Fiona, who uses sport to try and escape the slums of Uganda. And it links back to a situation I found myself in last year. Whereas in the film, um, Fiona had, had used sport to, to escape Uganda, I instead found myself in Uganda trying to escape sport. Running, to me, was everything. It was, it was my focus, it was my drive, it was my motivation, and ultimately, it was my life. Because everything I did revolved around running. You know, what time I would get up, what time I would eat, um, how I would recover, and all these things that would go through my head on a daily basis, all about, all about running. And in October 2015, I, I ended up crossing the finish line of the Amsterdam Marathon in a time of 2 hours and 25 minutes. I was the first British finisher in that race by about five minutes, and I was 25th in a field of tens of thousands. My time was also in the top 50 of, of any British marathon runner that year. And I, I crossed the finish line of that marathon and I was ecstatic, I was jumping for joy because I'd achieved something I honestly never thought I could. But three months later down the line and I was anything but happy. I had just lost my motivation for running, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. And, and also I'd split up with my ex-girlfriend and I just felt completely lost. And I think most people here can probably relate to a feeling that you have where you feel you just feel lost and you don't know where to go or where to turn. And you almost feel so far away from the person you want to be and you have no idea how to get that person back. And, and this was that moment for me. I felt, I felt just like that. And I thought, what do you do when you feel like that? You know, do you speak to your friends? Do you speak to your family? Do you, you know, even seek professional help? Um, and I should have done all of those things, but I, I didn't because I found it incredibly difficult to talk about my feelings. So I instead decided to fly out to Uganda to work in an orphanage um, for a couple of weeks because I thought that would give me a different perspective on life and I'd, I'd go over there and I'd come back and miraculously I'd feel different about things. Um, but the reality didn't quite work out like that. Um, you know, I, I went over there to get away from me and to get away from running um, and I ended up going to a uh, an orphanage, and it was called the Raise Uganda Now Academy. Um, or, when I got there, it had actually been abbreviated to the Run Academy. So, I'd gone all this way out to Uganda to get away from running, and ended up somewhere called the Run Academy. And I think probably I am the only person who could be that stupid. Um, but there I was. I was, I was at this, this orphanage, and I was supposed to be there for two weeks. But, sort of five days in, and I was sat there crying in the arms of the lady who runs the orphanage, and I'm feeling worse than ever, because I quickly realised you can go to one of the most remote places in the world, but, but ultimately you're still there, you know, your thoughts and your feelings don't get left behind, you know, they don't get stuck to customs, and, and, and I was there, and, and it was really awkward, you know, this lady, she was very nice, but I don't think she probably realised why I'd flown halfway around the world to, to cry in her bedroom, um, and it was, it was as surreal as it, as it was uncomfortable, but but I, I knew that something needed to change. You know, I needed to change. And I, and I flew back early from that trip. And I came back to England and I thought, this is probably the hardest challenge I'm ever going to have to face. And it was a challenge to look at my life and try and make a change. Because I think, 
We can all be guilty sometimes as well of hiding behind the phrase, you know, that's just the way I am. You know, but I was thinking, maybe it's not just the way I am. Maybe it is, in fact, the way I've chosen to be. And, and what if I was able to change that? What if I was able to, to change the way that I was and to, to make, make, you know, make changes to, to my life? And for all this time, I've been following a guy called Ben Smith, who some of you might have heard of. But Ben ran an incredible 401 marathons in 401 days. And this is obviously an incredible physical feat. But what impressed me more about Ben was, was just how he carried himself. You know, the challenge wasn't about, it wasn't about him, it was about his cause, which was anti-bullying. And he clearly found something that he was incredibly passionate about, and he had found something that was driving him. And I looked at what Ben was doing, and I thought, you know, I want to be like Ben. I want to use running to make a difference. And I was, I was also acutely aware I wanted to get running back in my life because running has a really big impact both physically for me but more mentally because that ability to put on a pair of shoes and just go and explore the world is, is incredible. I think it was something quite simplistic but something quite beautiful in that that you can just go out there and create your own world. You can turn left, you can turn right, you can go wherever you want but you can just be by yourself sometimes and that's a really, really nice thing because for me, it helps to get, you know, to, to tackle things that go on in, in modern life, to be able to have that release, that stress release. And, and I thought I needed to get it back, and I needed to get it back the right way, to not be this fixation on heart rate monitors, on, you know, mileage, and on all these other factors that running for me used to be about. So I thought, I need a, a challenge. And I, and, I, and I was thinking, what could I do? What could, what could I do? And, I thought I didn't really want to be like Ben, I didn't want to run 402 marathons because that sounded utterly horrible. I thought maybe I could run across France, you know, maybe I could run across Spain. And then I thought maybe I could run across Europe. And I stopped and I thought maybe I actually could run across Europe. And I thought there can only be about 30 countries in Europe and it can't be that hard to get between them. Um, I was very, very long. So I went to my computer and I, I found a definition of how many countries are in Europe. And this was a definition from the United Nations of 44 different countries. And on the list are, are some that are a little bit easier to get around and a bit more obvious, like Spain and Italy and France, and others on there like Albania and Serbia and Iceland and the Vatican City. You know, these were, were going to be very difficult to get between, but also to try and run marathons in. Um, so all I had at this moment, I literally had this. I had this list of 44 countries, and I had a map, but I had a spark of something. I had you know, an idea, and I had something you know, to focus on. So I spent the next few months just trying to work out a way to get between these countries, because you know, there's, there's no rules. There's, no one has ever done this before, so I didn't know where I needed to start or where I needed to finish. And I was getting to a stage where I thought I'd cracked it, but then you know, a plane didn't go at a certain time, or a bus didn't go at a certain time. So I was stuck again. I was you know, lost again. I didn't know how to get out of this problem. But this time I did the right thing. I spoke to someone. I spoke to my friend Bill. And Bill is an amazing, amazingly enthusiastic person. And he is someone that I knew if I told about this, he would be everything I needed him to be. He would believe in me and he would want to help. And when I told him, he was, you know, he was all that and more. He wanted to be part of this. He, he made me believe that I could do this. So me and Bill, we batted ideas back and forth for the next few, few months. And we came up with this. And I still look at this and it, and it still scares me quite a lot. <laughs> um, but this was the plan. Um, the plan was to start in Russia, to work our way through Eastern Europe, through the Balkans, um, to fly in from Poland to run the London Marathon, to then fly out to Portugal, to work right back through Southern Europe, to go up through Scandinavia, to fly to Iceland, to fly to Ireland, to finish 44 days after I had started. That was the plan, anyway. Um, but it was all going to be done on public transport. And that was going to involve 22 trains, 12 planes, 5 buses, 4 cars, and a ferry between Finland and Estonia. 
So I had this route, but I also it was there was a massive unknown because I didn't know, you know, if if one thing went wrong, that was it. If a bus didn't go, that was it, or a plane didn't go. So there were so many variables, so many unknowns. Um, but I also started to ask for help from other people. I was speaking to my brother, speaking to my physio, and and everybody I was speaking to wanted to be involved. They wanted to help. And I was starting to realise that by surrounding yourselves with positive and supportive people, it has a huge impact on your well-being. And you know, I needed that support at that moment. And whereas previously, when I had an issue that was related to my mental health, that I found it very difficult to talk about, I found it really quite easy to ask for help about something logistical or something physical. And I, I don't, again, think I'm alone in that. I think many people struggle to talk about their feelings and to open up when it comes to, to mental health. And, you know, this is the cause that I wanted my journey to be about. I wanted it to be about raising awareness for mental health because I have many friends and family who, who suffer and who still do suffer with a variety of different mental health problems. Um, some have tried to take their own life Others get by on a mixture of, of medication and determination that I have so much respect for. And, you know, they often do this when there is a lack of real support out there to help them. Um, but in terms of the challenge, you know, it started for these people. But I was becoming acutely aware that it was making me question my own mental health more and more. Because I'm um, somebody who finds it very easy to help others, and I'm always wanting to help others, but I found it very difficult to, to let others help me. And I'm someone who's always very up and down. You know, I can be on top of the world one minute, and the next minute I want to hide away from society, I want to go to my room and not speak to anybody. And it's very difficult when you feel like that, because you, know, you end up alienating the people closest to you. And I find it very hard to, to talk to those people and explain the way that I feel, because how do you almost explain the way you feel when you don't understand the way you feel sometimes? And that's what I, that's what I thought. And um, I then thought, you know, mental health, we all have mental health in the same way that we have physical health. And, you know, I, I had surrounded myself as well with people that suffered far greater than I did with mental health problems. And I thought, if I talked about my problems, that it's belittled them. But, but it, it isn't a comparison. I now know it's not a comparison. And there are many levels within mental health. And that by talking about things, we help ourselves, we help others, um, and we help end the stigma that still exists around mental health. And I now had this cause, you know, I had this mental health cause. I had this support from some amazing people and friends and family of helping to put together this route and give me the belief that this is something that I can actually do. So I was ready to set off on my journey. And what was going to be the most hardest and longest 44 days of my life? Um, I encountered lost luggage on day one. Um, I had buses that didn't go. I encountered injury, sleep deprivation, I nearly got arrested in Greece. Um, many different things happened. Um, but I also encountered some incredibly supportive people that were meeting me in other countries and helping to make this journey happen. There was a guy in here in the middle called Dimi who met me after 30 miles of my run in the Ukraine and he got me to that, that finish line. And he didn't speak a word of English and that was the example of people that were helping me. Um, and also in the top left, you'll see I'm sat in a bath of peas. And that could almost be a charity challenge in itself. But um, I went to try and find ice in Ukraine because my legs were hurting and I couldn't find any ice. So I thought it would be a great idea to find some frozen peas. Um, and I got back to my hotel room and I opened the bag and I threw four bags of frozen peas into a bath and sat in there for 15 minutes. And many people have since asked, why I actually emptied the peas, why I just didn't put the peas in the bag in the bar. Um, but I was very, very tired at that point. And, um, and it also meant that, you know, I, I had to spend the next 10 minutes scooping out peas from that bathtub so that the hotel staff didn't think, you know, that I was a very, very strange man. So that was an example of how I was trying to 
you know, having to be flexible in adapting to the situations. But 44 days after I started, I made it to that finish line in Dublin. I had covered 1,100 miles on foot, which is about the distance from here to Rome. I had travelled 11,000 miles on various means of public transport, which is about the distance from here to New Zealand. But most importantly, I had raised money and awareness for a cause that really mattered, and that cause was mental health. And I was also much closer to finding out you know, where I belong as a person, and also about you know, what mental health means to me. And going back to that, that quote from the start, sometimes the place you're used to is not the place you belong. I used to look at that quote, and I used to take it very, you know, the place you belong being a very physical thing. You know, it has to be somewhere. It has to be a town or a city or a country. But I don't think it does. I think the place you belong can mean just the world that you've created around yourself. You know, your values, your attitudes, your, your comfort zone. And what if we were able to look at the place we belong and just see if it is the place that we still want to be? And I just want to leave you with that simple thought and question. And that, that question is, where you belong.